So TeamBig is a collaboration between four groups. I'm with uh, Torque Robotics, which is a small uh, autonomous systems built from Blacksburg, Virginia. Uh, we're working with Virginia Tech, the 3D interaction group. That sort of was our OCS lead. Uh, Technica University of Darmstadt is our onboard software lead. And then we're now working with Oregon State, who is uh, the grasping and manip manipulation lead. So we're an interdisciplinary team, uh, multinational and multi-time zone. I think we're probably the most geographically distributed team. So in the talk, I'll sort of talk about our overall philosophy for approaching this, a little bit about our onboard and OCS. Uh, we used a lot of raw open source tools, talk about that. Go through some of our trials, results, lessons learned, and then sort of pull out a couple of uh, contribution technical nuggets to talk about, and then just sort of a brief slide about what we're working on right now. So our overall philosophy was that the operators were important team members. So we sort of, what we talked about was collaborative autonomy, the operators doing part of the work, the robots doing part of the work, and collaborative perception, the same thing. That the robots doing certain onboard process and pass it over to the operator to identify certain features in the environment, request particular levels of detail. Um, and then our approach was to try to provide multiple ways of doing a task, whether that was fully autonomously or more low level. We didn't do direct teleop, but we would sometimes manipulate a Cartesian space and then have the robot doing the low level planning. So there are cases we didn't get visual servoing implemented, but we had the operator basically doing visual servoing by moving a template around. Uh, we probably maybe took the first uh, stab at crowdsourcing. So we ended up using one main operator that was in charge of controlling the robot and then an auxiliary operator that was sort of in charge of requesting perception information, getting the right level of detail. The main operator could say, give me a point cloud here, and the perception operator could do that. Then we had some other people that were just sort of keeping us on task and script. So, the operator control station design philosophy is really to try to focus on well-defined HCI principles. Uh, we want to do the immersive environment, keep the operator um, fully informed, um, allow them to direct the ro robot at the appropriate level. Um, wanted to try to direct all of the action in these different views, so we focused sort of on a, a top-down map view, a main 3D view, which was most of our interaction, and then a uh, image viewer that would allow us to do uh, varying resolution, multiple camera feeds at the same time if we wanted. The onboard software, because Torx is a small company, we have our own IP, but because we were a multinational team, we couldn't use that, so we focused on using open source tools, really focused on basically the ROS ecosystem and using that tool chain. Uh, we made use of the RBDL Dynamics Library, uh, Ross Move It, we basically did sort of kinematic planning and then would send the trajectories to the robot for execution. Um, made a lot of use of uh, Point Cloud Library Octomapping for building our onboard world model and then we added features to let us request regions of interest and in varying resolution from, from the Octomap. Uh, the, uh, state machine system and then the footstep planning, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And then taking those tools and we added our own custom development where needed. Um, we're not walking experts, we don't do whole body control as of yet, so we basically leveraged the BDI behaviors that were provided. Uh, then sort of for world modeling, we just wanted to let the onboard software gather the data, pre-process it, and then just send what was needed at the appropriate resolution to the operator. Um, and then, again, planning. I'm going to go into detail about some of our footstep planning improvements, and then uh, we made a lot of use of use of movement. So trials results. We had eight points. 
think we tied for ninth with Team Thor and Team Keist. Um, so task breakdown, I'm going to talk about two of these tasks in detail. So three tasks, our, our manipulation was a challenge for kinematic reasons with the Atlas robot and some of the software. So we weren't quite sure what to expect. We ended up getting zero points. We got zero points on the wall. We were sort of struggling with that as well. That was a leadership issue that I allowed the team to choose the wrong tool. Um, we did not attempt the vehicle task. The valve task, we got four points as expected. Hose task, we got two points as expected. Terrain task, we felt pretty confident in getting two points and thought we had a decent shot of getting uh, four points. And then the latter task, we got the one point we, we went for. Uh, so that left us tied for ninth, and uh, <laughs> so, you know, we just sort of missed it. And I think we generally felt like we did not perform at our best. And we'll talk about some of the mistakes that we made. Uh, the good news is we're back, and I guess thanks to Google for choosing not to run in the next phase, and so that's led us, Team Thor, which is now two teams, and Team guys back in. So the door task, we earned zero. We really expected at least two points, and part of our issue was I think we went for four points and screwed that up, and so this was our major foobar. Um, we knew going in the importance of testing. We planned for a code freeze, and that first screen of all the people that I listed, that was pretty much our entire team, and so we had the same developers as operators, and um, we just never really were able to get to a point where we could say, okay, we're done, we're just testing. And we knew that was dangerous, but we didn't really have much of a choice. Um, and then this environment, because of that, we ended up having two different operators do the main control. One that did the opening the door and then switched to a different operator that was doing footstep planning. And so we had a couple of issues. Um, if you notice here, we changed the mode accidentally, and the arm moved, and operators didn't pick up on that fact. And so the first fall was caused by clipping the hook on the door frame. So we, we missed that. Uh, due to some state estimation drift, we sort of lost situational awareness, and the robot was out of position, and again, didn't pick up on that. And basically, we were going for four points and got zero. Uh, so our terrain fail, if you pay attention to sort of where the circle is, when I start the video here, you'll... This is sort of a view of our footstep planner and the plan we're looking to execute. So it looked like we got a good touchdown and then the robot sort of buckled up. And so talking to Boston Dynamics, um, they sort of said, yeah, that's a failure we see with our weak knees. Um, and that was the case. So I think there were some things that we could have done in software to compensate for that, but it was not an issue that we had seen really in our, our testing. And so that was sort of a surprise. Um, so we went in, you know, really at a good point when we did that first step down. And then by the time we recovered, we were just not able to get back over to get the second point. And then just doing that, uh, we were having issues with the state estimation drift. And we couldn't plan long-term steps, so we were doing sort of one step at a time planning, which was just too slow. So I'm going to now talk about a couple of the contributions that the team made. So we based our footstep planner on the, um, the Ross footstep planning package that's uh, Orno um, et al. back in 2011 and ongoing. It's basically any time search-based footstep planner. They're basically planning the contact points before you begin to execute the walk. And so basically they're just planning a state transition from one, one step to the next. And then their original mode was you define this sort of set of primitives that you're planning over. So we did a couple of extensions to that. So their first model was just sort of the state of the stance foot and then planning an action that moves the, the swing foot, defining a transition cost, and then so what we found was that was not able to give us stable enough paths, and so we wanted to start considering both the origin of the swing foot along with the stance foot and the transition models. And then the, the final 
um, extension we made was to actually now extend this into a 3D planner. So the state of each footstep now had the Z position and the roll and the pitch of the foot. The action space is still the same because you're just planning the offset and then the, the 3D pose is determined by the terrain. So we were doing some PCL based terrain fitting. And then this planner would basically let us, as we touched down, did a very excellent job of matching the pose of the foot to the ramp. Uh, and that improved the stability of the BDI walking. Uh, our cost functions, we basically use a layered cost where we would first analyze the number of steps and then as you start to prune down, then you would in increase the different cost terms to plan fast. And then we were also, instead of using a fixed footstep primitive, we were actually on the fly sampling from a set of permissible steps based on it as sort of a grid map of the obstacles. And so that let us do it actually a really good job of planning footsteps over the ramp and over the sloped um, the, the sloped concrete blocks, even though we didn't get to demonstrate that at the uh, competition. So talking about a little bit of our OCS development, sort of vision versus reality. So good HRI principles, you know, we want to have sort of minimal mouse movement, we want to have uh, common actions available by hotkeys, and so we, we basically early on said, okay, we want three main views, a simple 2D top-down view that we can do basic 2D navigation with very easily, a 3D view that's most of our interaction through, and then a image interface that lets us take data at different resolutions, and this was extremely important in the virtual challenge where you were sort of counting bits that you were summing up and so on. This was the basic vision. Um, this, this is sort of the version right before I got on the plane to come out here. Uh, we still got a little bit too much clutter with the, uh, the RViz interface showing up there, but basically this is fairly streamed down. But, sorry. Um, this is the version we actually went to trials with, and so this is sort of not good HR design, HRI design. Uh, too many widgets, too cluttered. Uh, the number of widgets we required more screen space. So it was a lot harder to follow. It required a, a lot more mouse travel than one would like. Um, this was sort of a necessity. We knew it was bad, but basically, given the limited development team we had, we had people developing particular applications. So whether it be the footstep planner, uh, they might have to develop their own engineering widgets before the OCS team would have time to integrate those, and we just basically ran out of time. So we ended up using a lot of the engineering development widgets at the competition. Uh, and so the visualization is basically based on our viz. We made some customizations to allow you to do a better selection uh, and manipulation of the camera view options inside the 3D environment. Uh, our Image viewer can let us pull in up to four different feeds. Uh, we can do low resolution and then select regions of interest within that. So just I'm going to sort of step through a sequence of slides. So we, again, the three main views, we can select a region of interest in the map view, and then that will pull in sort of a compressed 2D grid map, which is essentially a projection of a three of a full 3D Octomap on board. We can view that. This is showing sort of the low res image that we generally send to say bandwidth. Uh, we can define a goal right in the 2D map, do our footstep planning, visualize that, see that that makes sense prior to actually telling the robot to execute the step plan. Um, as we're moving and executing, we're projecting the 3D visualization data back into the images to see how things line up and to give us through situational awareness there. Uh, we can monitor progress during the execution. Um, as we need to, we can select regions of interest to pull in high resolution data and also do the same thing with point clouds. So we can either <coughs> click into a region and get a, 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 a high res point cloud around that area without having to send the full point cloud over. Um, and then our general mode of operation was have the operator insert a predefined template that had some grasps pre-planned relative to that template and so then we could 
line that template up to the point clouds. Um, we have this concept we call our ghost robot, where you can view the current state and then you can set the, the ghost robot to pre planned positions. So I think Sony said there was a, you know, they use the same concept of finding an approach direction and then the final grasp. So we sort of had our pre grasp and final grasp pose, and so we could check that, make sure both of those were uh, reachable by the robot before we send it to be executed. We had a case, um, so we could access, you know, by basically clicking some of these buttons. And now at the top of the screen, we can access different planning modes. So here we had a case with this task where the pre grasp was reachable, but then as the robot's executing and it shifts its weight, the the plan is saying, no, I'm going to now contact the table. And so the operator can go in and say, okay, no, I'm saying that's safe. Turn off the collision checking that move it's doing with the Octomap and just say, no, go, go for the grasp. And so in, in this version, it's actually it's fairly easy to get to that widget and get rid of that widget, whereas at the trials, we sort of had all the widgets up at the same time. Um, and then our mode, if we want to move the hand around, we can just click on the template and grab and move the template around, and then the hand will follow that in Cartesian space. Um, future plans, we're going to be reworking our controller design sort of better integration into the ROS ecosystem, make it more robot agnostic. Um, do some since we basically skipped all the advanced control and the whole body control framework that's now on the plate so we can tackle driving and getting up from balls. Um, I think as people mentioned earlier in the day, uh, drifted drift issues uh, cause a lot of ongoing issues and I think we're looking at the same approaches to visual slam or something that everybody else is doing. Um, improving the manipulation planning and IK so the interaction between the reachable workspace of the robot and the IK solutions that we're building and then also making improvements in the online RASP planning. Um, better integrate our footstep planning within the OCS so that the uh, operator can have better control of that, fewer widgets and then also allow us to sort of tweak footstep plans after they're generated so that we can take one footstep and say, no, I think it should be over here, and then automatically check to see if that's still within the reachable region and stability. And then the now that the OCS team is sort of caught up to all of integrating all of our engineering widgets, we're looking more into integrating some more advanced uh, 3D interfaces, whether that's a, a heads-up display or uh, just improved uh, Six off mouse issues. I'll take any questions. Okay. Questions for David? Um, this is maybe a question you've asked all, all of the, the athletic teams. How do you feel the simulation, the simulator, um, simulation phase might appear to you for the competition? And um, I was disappointed they weren't able to keep it up to date. I mean, basically, after the VRC, the simulator was useless for any kind of walking test. And the um, we could get a, we initially could switch back to the old joint names and inertias, and it would still work. But then they changed the behaviors and changed the way the step indices were working, and so we could no longer actually even execute our stepping controller in the simulator with the old model. Um, so we basically, at that point, just used the simulator to we pin the pelvis and then just do it for manipulation testing. Mm -hmm. And contact was never good. It was just more about, you know, can you reach it? How's the IK working? So like There's a sort of a general interesting question maybe at the heart of this. So it seems like simulators are really useful for doing control development. So we have our own NL simulator and IGMC does as well. And sure CME does to build walking controls and test them. But in terms of, you know, testing, you know, motion planners and grasp strategies, Really, kinematic playback is a pretty reasonable way to evaluate right. those algorithms. And so that, that you know, Gazebo was fine for that aspect. So, mm -hmm. you know, so we would just do the trick of pinning the hip so that we didn't have to worry about mm -hmm. upward stability and could just focus on the mm -hmm. Any Other questions? So um, one of the things you mentioned is your, you know, had the, the user, user interface was kind of spread out and you're putting it down so you can like pop things on and off now. Um, and it's definitely a cleaner thing, but 
imagine if you had a lot of screen real estate and you could kind of really spread things out so you didn't have to open and close anything. And you always knew where the tool, you, like, you know, the joint little tele off, like last resort tool is always down the bottom left. It seems like that could be really efficient if you had, like, you know, a touch screen interface or something. Yep. And you guys thought about that? We, we've talked about uh, a couple of things. One is going to more of a sort of a large format um, screen. Uh, we've talked about integrating potentially with a larger screen and then a touch table. So you could just sort of have the, the key selection right in front of you. The biggest thing is if you're doing it with a mouse, anytime you have to travel. And then one of, one of our goals was to always have a system that would work with two monitors on an engineer's station so that we yeah. didn't have to have some specialized stuff. Yeah. Great. All right, let's thank our speaker. All right, so that, uh, that concludes the workshop. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, Thanks for morning. Oh, yeah. And we'll, we'll hope to post videos online in the next week or two, I guess. So thank, thanks very much for, if anybody has any problems with the vi their video being posted online, just get in touch as well. We'll, we'll exclude that.